Okay, I meant to get this out sooner, but this is going to be a lecture on chapter 25, Evolution of Development, or Evo Devo. Um, so it's kind of a shorter chapter, but we're going to look at developmental patterns and the evolution of them. We'll take a look at how some single genes have been changed to maybe take on a different form or function um, in different organisms, how different waves ways evolve the same structure, and then we'll take a look at a case study of the diversity of eyes in the natural world. Um, so, you know, eventually I think what I'd like to do to start off with this chapter uh, would be to give each of you a, a bag of Legos, okay? And I would just instruct you to build something with your Lego set, okay? So each, each person would get basically the same number and shapes of Legos. Other than that, there would be no restrictions. I would just say, you know, try, you know use as many, if not all the Legos as possible. Um, and we would get something kind of like cool. Like, I mean, everyone would build something different given roughly the same pieces of Legos, right? So when you think of the evolution of development, um, you know, if you didn't use all your Legos in your sets, then maybe those are like genes that weren't used in an organism or turned on. Maybe they're vestigial or pseudo genes. Okay, they're just not used by certain organisms. Um, so I don't know. I just want to just just think about this activity if we were to ever do it um, as you, as we go through this this lecture. Like how some organisms carry the same genes, um, but maybe they don't use them or they use them in different ways. So. Okay, I also stumbled across a really cool um, scientific, scientific article about frogs, okay? So frogs that are closely related, some of them actually have completely different patterns of development. You know, in, in grade school, um, you were maybe taught that tadpoles grow into frogs, but there are some species of frogs where they don't start off as tadpoles. There's one frog that goes from the fertilized egg to an adult frog with no intermediate tadpole um, linkage between them. Um, there are some that do not develop tadpole structures except for maybe the tail because the tail is used for respiration. Um, I would say that about half of all frogs start with eggs in the water and then they go to a tadpole through metamorphosis to become adult frogs and the other include probably a wide, wide diversity of life cycles like um, eggs laid on leaves, nests made out of foam, maybe the eggs are placed in the throat, their stomach, or back of the mouth. And there's hundreds, actually hundreds of species that don't have a tadpole stage at all. And we call this direct development. There's even some species of frogs that have fangs that give birth to live tadpoles without laying eggs. Okay, so there's just this, just a wide range of patterns of development. Um, there. So here's a picture of um, some of those frog species. But yeah, take a look at these eggs with just the miniature frog in them in the adult form. Okay. All right. So section one is going to look at the evolution of developmental patterns. We're going to look at how the same gene can produce different morphologies in different species, identify types of genes most likely to affect that morphology, and then evaluate the limitations that comparative genomics has in exploring evolution of development. Okay. So differences among species do require a closer look into the, in the developmental processes. Um, you know, we know that changes in genes can alter development, thus lead to differences in how they do develop and as an end result, possibly produce different phenotypes. And so the phenotypic diversity that we see among species could result from changes in protein coding regions of many different genes, or maybe there's just a smaller set of genes that regulate the expression of those protein codein genes. Okay. So scientists looked at sea urchins that were closely related, but they have very distinctive developmental patterns. And they're like, what's going on here? So one species has this intermediate developmental stage, okay, called the pluteus. And the other one is a direct development where they never make that larva. It just jumps straight to the adult form. So possible hypothesis or hypotheses for this, the two forms have different developmental genes. Maybe one has the gene that makes the larva and the other one doesn't. Or the other hypothesis, or hypothesis um, would be that the two forms have the same sets of genes, but they just differ in the pattern of how that gene is expressed. And um, looking at the case study, um, they realized that, hey, they actually both have the same sets of genes, but they just undergo different gene expressions. So that's the, the one that's backed up with evidence. <clears throat> 
So a diagram just showing um, the life cycle of these sea urchins, where here we have the indirect development of the larva stage, and then it goes through metamorphosis uh, into that adult form. And then here we just go straight into an adult juvenile form um, to the adult. Okay, so some genes can be highly conserved, and yet um, they do produce wide varieties of structures and shapes or morphologies. So there's a small number of genes, about two dozen of them, that do regulate animal and plant development that they share. And we call them Hox genes or homeobox genes. And Hox genes, what they do is they establish the body plan, like um, ventral versus um, posterior, or lateral, or you know, basically just the body plan of animals. And um, Hox genes appeared before plants and animals diverged from each other. In plants, Hox genes are involved in the shoot growth, growth and leaf development in animals that establish the, the axes, if you will. Um, MADS box genes okay, are found throughout eukaryotes. They code for DNA binder motifs to turn on gene expressions. And in plants, they establish the body plan, especially in flowers like angiosperms. So highly conserved genes do help produce diverse morphologies. Developmental mechanisms can also exhibit evolutionary change. So one key vocab term you should know is heterochrony, alterations in timing of these developmental events due to a genetic change. And so it just means that if a mutation should occur in one of these genes, um, then you know it could control how a plant transitions from a juvenile to an adult stage. If there's mutations in heterochrony, it could delay in flowering. Um, and this might be beneficial depending on where this flower is at. It could, you know, if, if this plant was in the tundra where um, they have a short summer, well, if you flower early, you're going to have increased fitness to take advantage of that. However, most heterochrony mutations are lethal. Um, but if they do mutate, they could have a new phenotype emerge. So I did my best to try to find a diagram of heterochrony, and I really couldn't find one. Um, but just looking at two different species of frogs and their heterochrony differences and expressions of genes as they um, are developed. OK, another uh, developmental mechanism that could exhibit evolutionary change is called homeosis, alterations in the spatial patterns of gene expressions. So the other one is timing, and this is spatial. Um, so with homeosis, you know, there's been quite a few famous experiments called Bythorax drosophila, where we shift the gene expressions and we produce two instead of one pair of wings, or drosophila antipodia. Honey, I'm recording. Don't. Um, where the leg um, develops in the antenna, where, where the antenna should be. Um, so, yeah, these do occur naturally, but they also do occur in the lab. And um, when they do occur, they probably have little survival factor. But just know that we change the location of the gene expression. So a, a body part grows where it shouldn't grow. OK, changes in transcription. Um, so that's another way to sorry, exhibit evolutionary change. So we have DNA binding motifs. Remember, I, sh I guess I should say transcription factors are proteins that help regulate um, the expression of genes. Okay, so if you modify them, then as a start, as a consequence, um, it could s turn on or target a different set of genes or initiate a new sequence of developmental events. And then we also have changes in signal and pathway. We didn't really talk about um, chapter 19. I kind of skipped over it, but we did talk about cell to cell signaling and we did the, the uh, those packets. Um, but cells need to talk to each other. Okay, and so they coordinate info about neighboring cells and external factors through the cell-to-cell -cell communication. And if a ligand, which binds to receptor, changes, it may no longer bind to that target receptor. And then as a result, um, end up with a change in the, um, the, the gene or the homeotic phenotype. So understanding evolution of development, or evo-devo, uh, requires functional analysis. We compare genomes. Um, to understand these morphological diversity, okay? Uh, and then we also do functional genomics tests to test the actual function of a gene in different species. A lot of times, um, you know, we see a conserved gene and we know how it operates in one species and we can apply that information to uh, how it might work in a different species. We use model organisms um, to do this as well as genetic engineering. Great examples of model organisms would be like fruit flies and mice and rats and uh, definitely not humans though. So review question. Heterochrony is 
The answer is C, a change in the relative timing of developmental events. Vast differences in phenotypes of organisms as different as fruit flies in humans. Okay, didn't really talk, about, I didn't give you a number on this, but it's um, letter B, um, the manipulation of the time in a regulation of expressions of probably less than 100 highly conserved genes because we do share a lot of genes with uh, fruit flies. Um, that was touched on in chapter 24. Hox genes. are A, found in both plants and animals, and in homeosis. Uh, that should be C, spatial change in gene expression. Transcription factors are C, proteins that affect the expression of genes. All right, moving on to section 25.2, single gene changes in the alteration of form and function. So we'll look at how a small number of mutations can give rise to new morphologies, as well as even new species, how a gene could acquire a new function, and then talk a lot about gene duplication and how they can give rise to new functions in an organism. So basically, this is one or two gene mutations that lead to a new form. So a great, great case study of this is cauliflower and broccoli. Okay, um, Brassica or Raysia uh, has diverse phenotypes, and they are actually divided into subspecies. Wild cabbage, kale, tree kale, red cabbage, green cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, and cauliflower are all members of the same species, and these guys are examples of subspecies. And so that same species is from the wild mustard plant, Brassica or Raysia. Um, so cauliflower and broccoli um, develop from a stop codon. Okay, so there's this gene... Um, in another sister species called Arabidopsis, which we've talked about, um, that was cloned. And um, so this Cal gene cloned in Arabidopsis with another mutation, Epitalia 1. I know a lot of weird words here. But Arabidopsis could be transformed from plant with a limited number of simple flowers and be turned into miniature broccoli or cauliflower. Kind of cool. Um, so Cal and Epitalia 1 are needed for the transition um, and arose through duplication. So here's the um, phenotypic phylogeny tree, okay, where the st stop codon is here, and as a result, you get cauliflower and broccoli. If I go back to a slide here, the modified trait in broccoli and cauliflower has to do with flower buds. Um, so when absent, bare stems continue to make branches, but delay um, producing flowers, okay. In these regions, these codon regions, a stop codon tag is found in the middle of broccoli and cauliflower, and uh, it's revealed that they appeared after ancestors of broccoli and cauliflower diverged from subspecies, so before these two diverge, but before they actually diverge. So this is where they pegged, where the stop codon is. So summary of the story, um, cauliflower and broccoli arose from a stop codon. Okay, chiclid fish, which was also mentioned in a previous chapter. So remember with our chiclid fish in Lake Victoria in Africa, these fish have different types of snouts. There's bottom feeders that their jaws are short, and there's biters that have intermediate snout length, and there's rammers that have really, really long snout length, and it has everything to do um, kind of with the second set of jaws that took on different modifications based on the environment. And so this is adaptive radiation, very similar to our finches of the Galapagos Islands. Okay, so a single gene mutation could lead to a rapid evolutionary change where we have thousands of different um, chiclet fishes that, um, you know, feed or use their environment differently. So the different niches and feeded habitats led to a wide variety of these snouts and that these mutations in genes allowed individuals to access that food in different parts of the environment. So this is just a graph just um, looking at the link to the resource used, was it used for function or morphology, and then the functional complexity. And so when we talk about adaptive radiation, finches are pretty much like a great example of it, but chiclids could also be uh, added into that. Another example, okay, um, stickleback fish. Okay, so stickleback fish, uh, there are marine and freshwater populations. And if you look at the marine population, they originated after the last ice age and they have these bony plates that protect themselves from predators because there are a lot of big predators in the ocean. The freshwater populations of stickleback fish actually have lost their armor due to less predations in those waters. And so they've tied this armor to a gene called the ectodisoplasin or ETA gene associated with reduced armor in freshwater fish. 
However, this mutation arose in marine sticklebacks, and it does persist with a frequency of 1% in marine populations. No one knows why natural selection hasn't completely eliminated this um, ETA allele from marine populations, but it's still found in marine populations. So to test the hypothesis that freshwater fish with low armor allele have higher fitness, they took these marine stickleback fish that were heterozygous for the ETA allele, they moved them to the freshwater environment and they allowed them to breed. And we saw, or they saw a positive selection for the reduced armor allele. Um, that was observed. So it's kind of cool. They could like flip the switch and make that gene um, more frequent in that population, if you will. So the allele has become beneficial in freshwater environments and has evolved to high frequency due to natural selection. Okay, ancestral genes may be co-opted for new functions. So the definition of co-opted uh, occurs when natural selection finds new uses for existing traits. Um, including genes, organs, or other body structures. And so genes can be co-opted to generate developmental as well as physiological um, um, functions, I guess, by changing their patterns of regulation or by changing the functions of the proteins they encode or possibly even both. And so one example of an ancestral gene that's been co-opted for a new function is this gene called the brachial gene. Okay, this, I'm, I'm, I'm probably saying it wrong, but um, the brachial gene. So there's a species called the ascidians that are basal chordates. They have a nodal cord, but they don't have a vertebrae. So they're still considered part of uh, chordata. Um, but this brachial gene encodes a transcription factor in developing this nodal cord. Now the brachial gene is not a new gene. It appears in vertebrates, but it's also found in invertebrates too, like mollusks. They, it's a homologue associated with anterior posterior axis, establishing body plans. Um, the ancestor ancestral brachial gene is co-opted for a new role in nodal cord development. Um, it is a member of a gene family. Remember, um, gene family transcription box with a specific domain. So this, they call it a T box and it's a transcription factor. So these are proteins that are made to help regulate gene expression. So the protein that is created from this gene actually turns on genes. Okay. So if I had to summarize this slide, I would say, you know, genes with similar frequencies in two different species may work in different ways. Um, your book doesn't, in the old edition, they talk about mice and dogs and humans, how mice and dogs, the mutation actually causes a short tail to develop and humans lack tails, but they do have the wild type brachial gene. Um, so there's just still trying to figure out how genes are regulated by the brachial gene. So here's a picture of um, showing brachial gene expression in a developing nodal cord, but it's not expressed in other cells. So. Limbs have developed through modification of transcriptional regulation. So tetrapods have four limbs, um, two hind limbs and two fore limbs. So in humans, you know, we have the four limbs, that's our arms. A bird four limb would be the wing and they are actually homologous structures. Both express a gene called TBX5 for the forelimbs, and then for the hindlimbs to develop the gene responsible for turning those on, it's TBX4. So the if you have a mutation in the TBX5, um, we tend to develop holt orum syndrome as well as heart abnormalities. There's a link between limb and heart developments that are traced back to a limbless chordate that did not have a vertebrae called amphi amphioexis. Um, amphioexis has a homolog called amphitbx 4 5 expressed in the heart region. And so what we're looking at here is maybe possibly a splittage of this gene to take on two new roles. So they think that this amphitbx 4 5 gave rise to vertebrae TBX4 and TBX5 after it was duplicated. Um, so one suggestion is that TBX4 and TBX5 co-opted for limb development in vertebrates or that the TBX5 underwent changes in its regulatory rather than coding the actual um, DNA. So I guess bottom line or summary of this slide, um, whole genome duplications in vertebrae development yielded duplicated genes with redundant function and then natural selection could act upon those. And so um, now we have regulatory regions rather than coding regions that experienced um, change essential for the, the limb formations.
So gene duplications do provide opportunities for new gene function. We see this on plants as well. So a duplicate gene provides maybe a backup gene that can be mutated without being lethal to the organism. Uh, so we're going to explore a specific example of evolution of development through gene duplication and divergence in the flower form, uh, specifically Paleo-AP3, um, which is responsible for, for flowering. So before flowering plants, which are angiosperms, we had mad box genes that were duplicated, and they gave rise to genes called PI, PI and Paleo-AP3. And these genes affected stamen development, the male reproductive parts of um, the flowers. Paleo-AP3 gene duplicated, and it produced AP3. And AP3 also duplicated, um, so they call that duplicated AP3, and you die cuts, so two baby leaves that emerge from germination. So AP3 duplicate... Uh, required a role in petal development. So if we take a look at um, the phylogeny here, here's this ancestral gene, here's my PI and paleo AP3, and then we have angiosperms um, come into play. And we have a duplication, and then another duplication of, um, of, of AP3. So where am I? PI, yes, paleo AP3, AP3, and then the duplication. Boom, all right. Okay, so uh, AP3, we see this alteration in the gene, and now it's controlling petal development, and they've done experiments with this, with AP3 gene construct uh, in mutant Arabidopsis. So if you have the complete AP3 gene, petals are present, stamen are present. That makes sense, okay? But if you don't have the AP3, then you don't get petals, and you don't get stamen. And if you um, add and they say something here about the C terminus replaces the AP3. You get some stamen, but you don't get petals. So AP3 is responsible for petal development. Why was it important to create transgenic plants to determine the role of AP3 in petal formation? Well, then we could actually test to see AP3 in the petal development, so it's A. The brachial and TBX5 gene in vertebrates and the AP3 gene in flower and plants are... B, examples of co-optinogene for a new function. Which of the following statements about TBX5 is true? And that would be a TBX5, TBX4, and Amphi TBX4 slash 5 are very similar or have very similar coding regions. Okay, moving on to different ways to evolve the same structure. So I'm going to revisit homologous structures and homoplastic features and explain why two very similar morphologies can arise in different developmental pathways. So remember, homoplastic structures are basically convergent structures that have the same or similar function, but they do ar arise uh, independently. Whereas with homologous structures, um, they arose once from a common ancestor. So take a look at insect wing patterns and how they demonstrate homoplastic convergence. So moths and butterflies have these patterns or eye spots that help them protect, protect them from predation as well as help thermal regulate. And so they wanted to look at the origins of patterns through the recruitment of existing regulatory programs for these new functions. And I'm gonna talk about these new functions here on the, on the next slide, but you can see that they have lots of variation in these eye spots. So butterfly eye spot evolution is actually brought on by a gene called distillus genes. And this gene is actually used for limb development um, in insects and orthropods. But in butterflies, they are recruited for eye spot development on butterfly wings, basically a new function. Um, additional genes are recruited for to determine the overall size of these eye spots as well as the pattern of them. And you can kind of see that here, distillus um, gene is recruited for new function, usually used for limb development. Then it says the additional genes are recruited for eye spot formation. And then we get a divergence of genes um, that regulate the pigment formation. And as a result, you get a wide variety of phenotypes, okay? Flower shapes also demonstrate convergence. So there are two types of symmetry in flowers, radial symmetry and bilateral symmetry. So I just put down the definition in case you didn't know what radial symmetry is versus bilateral symmetry. But examples of radial, radially symmetrical flowers, daisies, ro roses, tulips, um, for bilateral snapdragons, mints, and peas. And bilateral symmetrical flowers or angiosperms um, are very attractive to pollinators. Pollinators like can identify them. And, and so they think or they believe, or I should say, just say, there's a lot of evidence that support that it's a, a very important factor in its evolutionary success to be pollinated and um, to continue to development. So anyways, they wanted to look at which genes were involved in bilateral symmetry. 
Okay, so they found this gene called the CYC gene uh, in snapdragons that's responsible for bilateral symmetry. And if there were any mutations in this gene, then we saw radially symmetrical snapdragons. So we were like, okay, we know that this gene is responsible for bilateral symmetry. So then researchers selected flowers that evolved bilateral symmetry independently from those snapdragons and cloned that CYC gene. So this brings up the second question of research. Are the same genes involved in numerous independent origins of asymmetrical flowers? Well, the data on this one's kind of all over the place. So they compared the CYC gene sequence among other phylogenetically diverse flowers, and it's indicated that both radial symmetry and bilateral symmetry has evolved in multiple ways in flowers. Radial symmetry is the ancestral trait, but there are some radial organisms or species that actually have a bilateral ancestor. So they kind of like went back. Um, the gain of bilateral rows independently among some, so that means not all species because of the CYC gene. So um, yeah, kind of all over the place on the data on that one. Um, whereas the CYC gene is not homologous, uh, bilateral symmetry has been brought on by other ways. Okay, homoplastic structures are A, can involve convergence of completely unrelated developmental pathways. Independently derived mutations of the CYC gene in plants. Okay, the answer is actually D, because all of these, um, you know, like I didn't say it's preferred. Um, well, actually, all of those are incorrect, they're just false. So D, none of the above. Sorry. All right, the final section looks at diversity of eyes in the natural world. So we're going to look at how a compound eye of a fly, the human eye, and the eye spot of a ribbon worm could have a common evolutionary origin. So morphological evidence indicates eyes have evolved at least 30 times. This is the newest edition of, of our college biology book. I will say that the last edition that we purchased said 20 times. So as you can see, we've gained more information about eye, the, the history of uh, evolution of the eye. So the structures of eyes of different types of species are different. We see compound eyes, simple eyes, eye spots like you see on the, the jellyfish. And so morphologists concluded that eyes are examples of convergent evolution and are homoplastic because they have maybe, um, um, uh, sorry, evolved um, differently and in different sets of species that are not homologous to each other. So this view holds that the most recent common ancestor of all these forms was probably some primitive animal that had no ability to uh, detect light. So let's take a look at eye evolution. The same gene, PAC6, initiates fly and my mouse eye development. So this gene, PAC6, codes for a transcription factor that's really important in lens formation. Now in mice, they call it the PAC6 gene. In flies, they call it the eyeless gene. This is a homologous gene. Okay, it triggers lens formation in both insects as well as vertebrates. And how they know that is they took the PAC6 gene from mice and put it into a fly. And they put this gene into a fly and they turned on the expression in its legs. So only the PAC6 gene was turned on in the legs and an eye formed on the leg. Insects and vertebrates last diverged from each other approximately 500 million years ago. So to see eyes, okay, like, you know, eyes of a vertebrae versus insects, there's huge differences, but this gene seemed to function normally in the insect genome. It's pretty mind blowing. Um, we have fish that call the Mexican tetras uh, that have surface as well as cave dwelling members. And when you take a look at the, the PAC6 expression um, between the two in cave fish, the expression is reduced. The eyes start to form and then they degenerate. So here's a picture just showing the mouse PAC6 gene in mice um, makes an eye on the leg of a fly. You can see that right there. And our surface dweller versus our cave dweller with the loss of the PAC6 gene. Now, ribbon worms, not planaria, which are flatworms, use PAC6 gene for the eye development, which is kind of fascinating because the ribbon worm evolved later than the flatworm planaria. Um, ribbon worm can regenerate if the head is removed, as you can see here. So if we remove the head that has the eye spots, um, the head will regenerate. And then they probed it for the PAC6 gene expression and the eyes regenerated or the eye spots regenerated. Okay. Planarians um, also can regenerate their eyes. If you cut a planarian in half lengthwise, it can regenerate the missing half as well as the second eye spot. Um, so um, another thing I want to emphasize with the planarian 
they do have a PAX 6 gene, but it's not associated with the regeneration of the eye spot. Instead, I think the PAX 6 gene is associated or expressed in the central nervous system. So different use for the PAX 6 gene in planaria. Now, cnidarians, and these are a group of organisms that we will discuss later on in the semester. Um, cnidarians are like jellyfish, okay? So you see down here, the jellyfish, hydrozoans, and the cubozoans. Those are both jellyfish, but hydrozoans and cubozoans. Um, so PAX genes involved in eye development um, occur much earlier in our evolutionary history because we'll talk about animals, but the first animals were probably radial and then bilateral symmetry developed later on because I said you know radial symmetry tends to be ancestral so to see PAX6 genes involved in eye development um, just means that it's much earlier in our evolutionary history than, than we think so in the cnidarians or the jellyfish we have two groups the hydrozones and the cubozones that do rely on PAX a, that's the hydrozones, and PAX B, cubozones, for eye development. And so they repeated the transgenic fly experiment, and they placed the PAX A gene in a fly, and they made a compound eye on the leg again of that poor fruit fly, right? So several explanations for these findings, okay? So eyes in different types of animals evolved truly independently. That's the first hypothesis. Um, but why are PAX genes so structurally similar? Why do they play a similar role in so many different types of groups? Because like I said, you could take these PAX genes and put them in different species and, and all of a sudden it functions normally. Um, PAX6 gene is also involved in the development of the forehead region. So maybe they're like, hey, it has some type of regulatory role in the forehead of early bilateral lens and um, has independently co-opted several times to serve a role in eye development. So that's one hypothesis. The second hypothesis is that the PAX6 gene acquired a role in eye development only a single time in a common ancestor. And then when, you know, one diverges from it, then, um, then we have uh, the PAX6 gene for basically eye development in all of these different types of species. This is consistent, like, there's evidence for this because, like I said, you can take the PAX6 gene and put it in a different species and you get the same role. There's a lot of uh, similarity in the DNA as well as the functional replaceability of it. So of these two hypotheses, you know, they're thinking that this one um, is just more supported by the evidence. Okay, review questions. The final slide. Eyes of vertebrates and invertebrates. D may be homologous at the level of, of the initiation of the development of a visual receptor. And then which of the following statements about PAX6 is false? It is D. Um, it's not used in planaria. It's um, PAX6 is expressed in the central nervous system. So, all right, that does it for Evo Devo. Whew. All right, let me know if you have any questions. Here we go.